I believe a lot of Americans have spending problems and are not financially literate, which is very unfortunate within this space. And I think that's something would be great that, you know, somebody would finally start governments and kids in high school and stuff really teaching them more about this. But what we're seeing is because home values increased so much over the last few years, people took out home equity lines of credit, second mortgages, to pay off all the credit card debt. Now, guess what they did with all that credit card? That was at zero back up again. And now people are starting to default on their first and second mortgages. Today on the show, I have the pleasure of speaking with Chris Seveny. Chris is a seasoned real estate investor and a professional with over 25 years worth of experience. And he has managed more than $1 billion in real estate and has built a portfolio of over 500 node investing deals worth about $75 million. He's always had a passion for entrepreneurship. And with Seveny Investment, he has, has a great experience building the business. And the mortgage node investing is a very niche community. So finding like-minded people to talk to really, really makes him tick. So I'm really excited and pumped to have him on the show today to share his incredible experience with us and his knowledge. But enough out of me. Let's get him out here. G'day, Chris. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today, mate? Good. How are you today, Reed? I am doing really well. And you're dialing in from Virginia, just near DC, right? Correct. Yep. Just uh, eight miles outside of uh, the, the United States mess, I like to call it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome stuff. Well, mate, look, we like to start the show like I'll ask every, all my guests, and that is rewind the clock and tell me how you made your first ever dollar as a kid. It's interesting when you asked that question to me, I had to think. And the first dollar I made as a kid was uh, selling some baseball cards. I grew up, um, aged myself here, but um, I was born in the mid 70s, grew up in the early 80s. And, you know, I was playing literally, used to collect uh, baseball cards and I uh, used to trade them and uh, also, um, you know, sell them as well when I was a little kid. So that's how I made my first, uh, literally, probably my first card I probably sold for a dollar. <laughs> nice. Awesome stuff. Walk us through the journey of how you got into this business because you, you got 25 years of experience, but if I did the math, I'm sure you had a life before real estate. What was it and what made you go down this path? I've always been in real estate ever since college. I graduated college. And when I was going to college, I went for civil engineering. And up until my senior year, I thought I'd be a civil engineer designing bridges and buildings. And then uh, speaking with people who worked in a space and industry, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, well, do I really want to just spend the next 30 or 40 years designing a bridge? It kind of seems a little boring. And I flipped and made a switch to work in the construction management side of things. So kind of civil engineering is, you know, construction management is kind of a piece of it. Um, so I spent 10 plus years working for a large Boston based general contractor because I'm originally from the Northeast. And after um, 15 years working for that company, I got burnt out and uh, made the switch, which a lot of uh, people who are in commercial construction will say, I went over to the dark side and the dark side being on the development side. And I flipped over to work for a real estate developer. I was overseeing all their multifamily portfolio. And that's when I started building my own portfolio because the uh, boss at the time said, you know, what do you own for your portfolio? I'm like, ah, oh, really nothing right now. We're planning on just building our primary residence. And I got my 401k. And when I said that, he just died laughing. And he's like, you realize like, you're not gonna be able to retire with that, right? And I'm like, well, you know, and he's like, you really got to start buying. And he's like, the last, this is in like 2012 timeframe. He's like, you know, the last few years have been like prime season. So uh, I started buying real estate in 2013 and 14. Unfortunately, um, I always blame my wife for getting out of buying the rentals because we were buying a lot of properties that needed rehabs. We had two kids, little kids at the time, and it was just too much. We could not handle, you know, managing the rentals and everything. So I was like, that's enough. And that's when I found out about mortgage note investing, which I've been doing now for the last seven years and started at zero in mortgage notes. Now, you know, we bought over 600 plus now and continue to buy more. That's awesome. And your story is a carbon copy of mine. I'm a civil engineer as well. I worked on bridges back in the day. <laughs> I came to the US and got a structural engineering job in this in New York, moved to LA, got sick of the engineering world and transitioned and worked for a big developer here as well before going out and doing my own thing. So literally the exact same thing. And I tell so many people listening to these these shows, like if you have a skill set that you can transition into the world you want to be in, regardless of the industry, use it and try and go get the highest paying job so you can learn 24 seven 
in the job and then obviously do your side hustle as well, which just sounds like what you've done. So with that being said, what's the um, how's the note business going these days? I've had a couple of people on the show. Um, maybe you want to just maybe break it down for those people listening about what note investing is all about. Yeah. So it's interesting because I had been in real estate for you know almost 20 years and I didn't know note investing existed to what we do. Most people have heard of hard money lending or private lending, very common for fix and flippers and real estate investors. Uh, but mortgage note investing is when you're buying notes that have previously been originated by a bank, a rocket mortgage, a financial firm, and they sell them on the secondary market. Most people don't realize over 50% of mortgages get sold. Most people who have a mortgage, you might get a notice, say, now make your payment to this company. Well, your mortgage was sold. Where we specialize is we specialize in the loans that are in distress or behind on payments. Now, we like to tell people that what that means is most people think, oh my God, I'm a week late on my mortgage. You're going to come knock down my door and pull me out in handcuffs. Uh, our average delinquency is about five years people wow. behind on their mortgage. So that's usually like eye opening that how does it go so long? And the reality is these com most mortgage companies, they're not built to handle distressed debt. They're like a car manufacturer with an auto plant. You know, they just spit out these mortgages and they pay every month and everything's good on that assembly belt. But if something goes wrong, they have to, you know, take it off the belt and then it just goes down this rabbit hole of a lot of red tape. A lot of times it's in their best interest that they do want to sell these. Interesting. Interesting. And what are you doing in terms of what size notes are you buying? So right now our average note is roughly about a hundred thousand dollars. Um, and we buy them at a discount. So, and that's one of the things people are like, well, how do you make money when you're buying something that they're not paying on? We buy them typically anywhere from 30 to 80 cents on the dollar uh, is what we'll pay. And it depends on the state, the value. There's a lot of things that go into that, but we try and target, you know, mid 20% returns on these non-performing notes. And the way we like to simply explain it to people is, People will buy a house that needs renovations to upgrade it and then sell it at a premium. We do the same thing, but we're not buying the house. We're buying the loan where we try and renovate the borrower. We try and get them on new payment plans, increase the value of the loan, and then turn around and sell it back on the market. The little that I do know about note investing, um, Aspen Funds out of Denver is a is a group that I'm very familiar with and had the the CEO, the pleasure of interviewing the CEO on this show. Just about the, the 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 changing and working with the individual borrower because it seems like it's not very scalable. It, you, because you've got to have like, every single person is going to be different. Every single person comes to the table with their own emotions, their own baggage, and you know you get some random person calling up named Chris from Seventy Investments and be like. Hey, I want to talk to you about your delinquency, and they're like, ha be, you know, they hang up on you. So, yep. how do you like? How do you how do you produce it at scale? It's the team around you. For example, we typically don't deal direct with the borrowers. We use a third party loan servicing company, and they may manage fifty thousand loans or however many loans. They're licensed in every state. This is what they do for a living. It's kind of like a debt collector. So mm -hmm. they mail the statements. They you know take the payments. They will follow our lead. So we still manage the loan. Let's say we want the borrower to $10,000 behind. We say, if you can give us $5,000, we'll take the other five and push it to the end of the loan. We make that decision and they go execute on it. Now we're like the football coach and they're the players where we give them the play. They go and try and execute it with the borrower. Typically, you're right though. Most borrowers will click hang up. So we typically may have to get an attorney involved and then send what's called a demand letter, basically putting them on notice that they're behind. Typically, most people never open their bank statements, um, sorry, their mailing statements because they're behind on their mortgage. They just don't wanna look at it knowing they're not gonna pay it. But the moment they get a letter from the law offices of ABC, that usually gets people's attention. So that's how one way we typically will get, um, get them to come play ball with us. And what's the time of when you acquire these notes and thinking from the investment point of view or the investor point of view, yeah. what's the average time that you get them to start producing cash? So say if you, let's just say 50 cents on the dollar, you bought a hundred, the note was originally a hundred thousand dollars. It's now, you bought it at 50. Mm -hmm. At what point, you know, I give you $50,000, Chris, what, what am I getting return on my money? You know, is it six months down the line? Is it 12 months down the line? Like when do they start paying on average? Within about 90 to 120 days. And if they're not paying by that time, we just 
continue to move forward with the legal process. Typically, like I said, we only foreclose on about 10% of our portfolio. Mm-hmm. So it's actually a very small amount. And a lot of those are actually because borrower's dead or they just don't want the property anymore. Um, maybe they might've gotten divorced or they outgrown it. So most instances, especially in today's economy and market, where are the people gonna go? You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> so if I'm losing my house and they probably, you know, some of them may have a lower interest rate than they can get, rents have shot up. A lot of times these mortgages are actually less than what a rent payment is. So, you know, they really are forced to come to the table now if they can afford it. So are you buying, I'm assuming if I'm an investor, I I invest into your fund. Are you giving me a return from day one or you, you know, because you're uh, amortizing the sort of the the return or the cash flow over so many loans? Yeah. So what we do is provide monthly distributions to investors um, within our fund. But also our fund is a mix. We do have performing loans as well. We don't buy 100% non-performing. So we'll buy a percentage and earlier on in our fund that performing scale is higher ratio. Like right now, when we started our fund, it was roughly about 70% performing, 30% non-performing. And as we continue to grow, it's going to flip because those non-performings, which typically take 12 to 18 months to get worked out and sold. Uh, and we're, you know, just over a year within our fund. So as we start to turn some of those assets, um, you know, we're starting to increase the non-performing scale um, within the fund. Yep, yep. No, I think it's it's important to know that about, you know, it's like buying, you know, real estate or multifamily. It's like turning a ship. You're not just going to have, it's not going to flick on the lights and all of a sudden the cash flows great. You know, it's going to take 12 to 18, 24 months to start turning a property around. It's the same thing with these notes. It takes time. And so investing in a, the difference between what I do is I buy individual large apartments. It's yeah. like, it's relying upon that large apartment to start operating well, where you're on your side in the fund, you've diversified your risk over both performing, which means it's paying cash flow from day one and non-performing. So there's a balance and you always want to try and keep that balance, I assume. So you can keep the investors paid and happy, not breathing down your neck because if it was all non-performing, you'd be like, we can't pay monthly distributions because nothing's coming in the door. <laughs> yeah. So it's, you know, best way for a lot of people, investors, it's almost like having a a new build product while owning a uh, owning an apartment building. You got one product that, you know, basically you're spending money on, which we do on non-performing because we have legal and other costs to then enhance that property and value that we eventually will liquidate and sell for the profit. While in the same token, we have some cash flowing assets as well. Yep. No, it's perf- beautifully said. And, and I think that's a why the benefits of having a fund, whether it be a, a, yep. a mortgage note fund or a real estate investment fund, is that you have diversification and you know one deal doesn't go, is taking longer to work out than these four or five other deals. Well, that, you know, they, they sort of make all boats sort of swim, uh, float equally, yep. if that makes sense. So what's the sort of goal now? And, and have you seen any changes in the last little while with the change in the economy? You mentioned earlier that you know, some mortgages are actually cheaper to pay than going out and getting rent. What are other things are you seeing in real time from your perspective as we come through this, you know, the, the, the fastest rate hike in, in modern history? Um, you know, what, what's, what's happening in real time boots on the ground as, as you're sort of performing these notes? Yeah, it's really been an interesting space. It's very, right now, it's very similar to traditional real estate where the bid ask spread for what sellers are looking for assets and what people are looking to pay is very wide gap. So there's not a lot of transactions going on. Just like people who invest in multifamily, if you're buying multifamily deals, you're seeing the number of transactions basically you know, falling off the cliff. We're seeing a lot of that in note investing as well because sellers' expectations or pricing has gone up. It's starting to, I think, come over the mountain now uh, because they've been holding on to product a lot longer. And previously, when you're holding a loan and the property keeps appreciating, it's really not a bad thing um, because you may have to pay taxes on these non-performing assets to keep, you know, avoid tax liens. But if the property is increasing in value, basically you can recoup that cost. Now that prices have flattened or start to come down a little bit and some of this equity that people had is going away, it makes, um, you know, more flipping towards a seller market um, on the note space itself. Now on the I'll call it borrower side of things. So that's kind of us buying with, you know, business to business. Um, But what we're seeing in the market is very interesting because I'm a person who 
You know, I believe a lot of Americans have spending problems and are not financially literate, which is very unfortunate within the space. And I think that's something would be great that, you know, somebody would finally start, you know, governments and kids in high school and stuff, really teaching them more about this college and everything. But what we're seeing is because home values increased so much over the last few years, people took out home equity lines of credit, second mortgages, pay off all the credit card debt. Now, guess what they did with all that credit card? That was at zero back up again. And now people are starting to default on their first and second mortgages. And banks previously were more you know, willing to do certain types of workouts. But now because of everything else that's going on in the banking world where everything lending has gotten a lot tighter, banks are getting crushed on commercial real estate. So they have a lot more bad debt on their balance sheet. They're trying to offload that. So they're starting to sell a lot more of this debt, which also makes it harder for people to get some of these workouts and other things they wanted previously. That was very easy to come by. Today, it's much more difficult, A, to get capital and B, get these workouts. So unfortunately, we're at all time lows in the amount of distressed debt that's out there because of you know how much money the government pumped into the system. That's starting to increase. And unfortunately, it's starting to rear its ugly head. But you know, we're just at the infancy stages and everything in real estate does take a lag in time. But in a year from now, I think it's going to be a very different story, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Do you think that your crystal ball is showing 2008 distress or you don't know? I don't think it's that much distress because back then there was a lot of fraud. But what's interesting is like some of the things we're seeing, um, because we primarily buy first position liens, but we see some second position in banks. And banks aren't doing a lot of the lending nowadays. It's actually kind of like Rocket Mortgage or these other firms. And I'm just using Rocket Mortgage as an example, um, not good or bad. What I'm seeing is when they're giving these people these loans, they're pulling AVMs. They're not even stepping foot in these houses to see like what these look like. So they're just like, oh, the model says your house is worth $400,000 today. But nobody even drove by to see like, you know, is anyone living there? Um, you know, what the inside look like. Some of these models where they're basing some of these loans, I think are in trouble. Like I said, I'm not predicting 2008, but I think the rosy returns of real estate people are getting in the last five years. I think we're going to see a lot of flatlining. And, you know, if pricing goes back down to 10% above 2019 or 2020 prices, I don't think anyone would be complaining, um, but it would still, you know, take a little bit of drop. I mean, what, it went up 30% in some markets over the last two years. So, I do think it will slowly make its way down, but not a complete crash. Right. No, and, and I think you're saying an adjustment of somewhere yeah. between fifteen to twenty percent is an adjustment. Is a that would be a bear that would be a bear market in the stock market if that was to happen. If you lost twenty percent in value you know, mm -hmm. very quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. Interesting to say that I'm already seeing. I'm picking up assets right now at twenty percent, twenty five percent discount to the peaks of 12 to 18 months ago. So, and that's in the commercial side. Uh, do you do any commercial loans or just resi? We'll do some commercial. As we grow, commercial loans are typically a much larger scale and number. So trying to keep our portfolio diverse. As we continue to grow, we'll look at a little more commercial side of things. Commercial is much easier to deal with than a homeowner or borrower because of compliance and all the laws and everything. But, um, you know, I mean, we've have, we do have some business purposes and commercial loans, but it's only probably about 10% of our portfolio. How are you with the commercial side, just because I'm interested on the commercial, are you going directly to local lenders that have that, you know, how are you finding the data to go find these distressed commercial assets? Yeah, what typically happens is, you know, a lot of the people who hold these loans, um, they'll go through what's called a whole loan trader which is a company that also does like mergers and acquisitions. Um, for example, a company called Mission Capital, Citus AMC, um, and uh, Garnet Capital. Like they also do, I think like they're on the list, like some of them will be selling some of Silicon Valley Bank product. So they sell billions of dollars a year. And they're like the clearinghouse because some of these lenders, they don't have a lot of distressed assets. So they don't have somebody on staff They're like, oh, who do I go to and sell this? So these traders are kind of like brokers, like a commercial real estate broker. Hey, go to your network, put this out, and you know, let's see what we can get for it. Gotcha. And so you just have relationships with guys in these strategic banks or sorry, strategic firms that are the clearinghouse that come to you and say, hey, Chris, I've got a, I've got a couple of these things on my books. Uh, you know, do you want to take them down? Yep, exactly. 
That's awesome. What's the plan for the business moving forward here in the next couple of years? Like, where do you want to grow from? You, you obviously started as a civil engineer. You worked your way into developments. Mm-hmm. Um, sounds like you did mm-hmm. your own little bit, fix and flipping, and 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 being a mm-hmm. landlord for a period of time. Now you're a node investor. What are, what's the what's the future hold? Yeah, so we want to grow the company between about 150 and 250 million, and that's kind of like the uh, prime, where we see kind of a prime spot because there's a lot a lot of larger funds that are, you know, billion dollar funds. And then there's some smaller ones that are 20 to 50 million. There's not a lot in that 100 to 250 million that then we can be almost a direct buyer from those billion dollar funds, but also have a lot of people below us at that 20 to 50 million dollar range that we can also sell product to. So kind of want to find, we're not looking to be the biggest. Um, you know, we're looking to find a nice niche spot where, you know, we want to be the best and uh, focus on, we're very target focused on what we do. We are in mortgage notes, but I do have background in, you know, commercial construction and so forth. Eventually, maybe, you know, if we continue to grow, I have another vertical on some, you know, smaller development or on some deals um, to continue to grow the company and give us the flexibility if one market does dry up that we can quickly shift. But right now, you know, we're strictly focused on the the note side and growing that to you know, where we want to see it. The, the, the AUM essentially is what you want to what you want to yep. grow to. What was the last question I was going to ask you? Are you across the country? Do you do you buy notes anywhere? Yeah, pretty much. You know, we're in forty states, and the states we're not in. You know, I joke. I don't know if there's houses in some of those states, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, typically, you know, Alaska, Hawaii, we haven't bought anything. Pacific Northwest and the Northeast, we typically try and stay out of because those have much longer foreclosure timeframes. And then you know, the Dakotas, Montana, Wyoming. You know, rarely do you see, um, you know, distressed debt coming from some of those uh, more, uh, less uh, um, occupied states. Awesome. Well, mate, I I wish you all the best moving forward. And as we wrap up the show here, uh, we like to dive into the lightning round called the Top 5 Investing Tips. You ready to get into it? Yep, let's go. Mate, question number one, what is the daily habit you practice to keep on track towards your goals? Inbox zero. Inbox zero, what's that? So uh, I always have... End of day, no emails in my inbox. I have them, <laughs> I have them filed or tagged for a task that I need to do. But anytime I see like somebody on a, a Zoom call and they open up and their inbox has like nineteen hundred emails in it, I just start like you know, um, you know, basically having convulsions. Yeah, <laughs> I'm exactly. I think maybe it's the engineer in me. Like I can't yep. have. I've got to clear that inbox out. I'm obsessed with my emails, and I'm about to go away for two weeks, and I don't know how I'm not going to have that inbox B, uh, inbox yep. zero, but I, I love it. Uh, question number two is who's been the most influential person in your career to date? Throughout my career, because you always grow. Um, early on, a um, guy by the name of John Lamar, who I worked for, really taught me a lot about construction management. The guy who kind of flipped the switch to really get me investing in real estate was a guy by the name of uh, John Fahey, who now in San Diego, re- I think he may have just retired recently, but he was my boss who was the one who basically was told me is like, hey, you got to start investing in real estate. So. Awesome. Well, John, uh, if you're listening, which mm-hmm. I don't think you would be, but uh, yeah, you, you're, you're Chris's number one most influential person. Uh, question number three is what's the most influential tool you use in your business? And it, when I say tool, it could be a physical tool, like a, a journal or, or, or mm-hmm. a phone, or it's a piece of yep. software that you just can't run the business without. What is it? My Remarkable. Ah, so it's okay. a it's a digital notepad tablet that you know it doesn't have games or apps on it it's literally just a notepad and for me i used to have you know the legal pads everywhere and have five different ones and always pull the wrong one out so <laughs> this one just has all its folders on it uh this has been um you know a saving uh saving grace for me where i can stay organized i haven't tr- transitioned i still like the note the, the pen and paper but i do go through my Hardback uh, journals, yeah. and I'm you know furiously know. writing down. Try stuff one as of we these because the pen on it writes like a traditional pencil, so it's like crazy. Especially if you're an engineer and stuff, and you can put <laughs> um, you know change the background for the different grid lines and stuff. Oh yeah, <laughs> you just can't get enough of it. That's Nerding awesome. out about you know, nerding out, N- yeah. nerding out. That's awesome, my friend. Uh, question number four has been: What's the, been the biggest failure in your career? What did you learn from that failure? So I was working for a company briefly back in right around 08, and the company went under. Basically, seeing how they operated things was one, but actually while I was saying this, um, the biggest failure now goes back into 2005, where I was construction project manager. It was the first job I was managing. And um, basically, we were carrying 
a negative negative budget line items to basically keep the fee where it was shown and just kind of carrying a negative contingency. And um, basically we continue to have issues um, on the project. And it was just, we had three contractors go out of business. The supervisor, the VP on the job came to me one day and basically scolded me. And I mean, he lit me up um, and people probably don't do this anymore, but um, basically told me either learn how to budget and forecast or go sit on the second floor in accounting. Because if you're just gonna report every month how much we're losing, I don't need you. But if you're gonna figure out how much we're gonna lose at the end of the day, that's what I wanna know. So it was actually very enlightening um, in understanding a lot about management and fiscal responsibility. Those moments when you, you know, when the rubber hits the road and everyone's stressed out and uh, yeah. you know, you, you're trying to figure it out and just brainstorm at, at the end of the day and having those hard conversations, I think that's, that's really, really awesome. Last question, mate, is where can people reach you to continue the conversation that'll be in your sphere? Where do they go? Yep, they can go to our website, which is 7E Investments. It's the number seven, the letter E, then investments.com, or email me, Chris at 7E Investments. I'm sure this will all be in the show notes. Mm -hmm. uh, or you, you Google my name, it's not a you know very common name, so I'm sure you will find me. That's awesome, my friend. Look, thank you so much for jumping on today's show. I just want to repeat some of the things I, I took away from today's show. I think you know your ability to transition over time. You know, a very similar story to myself. Good on, good on to meet another engineer who 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 found or sorry, had a had a skill set was able to be applied in another industry in the in, in terms of the dark side. Um, but then going on to really finding your passion uh, in the node investing and figuring out how that world works. And I, I liked how you you sort of. Uh, balancing your portfolio to, between non-performing and performing notes to really produce for your investors, and uh, it's going to be an industry that you're going to be, you're still going to be in, uh, you know, in 10, 15 years from now. So I wish you all the best. Uh, so thank you so much for jumping on today's show. Enjoy the rest of the week, and we'll catch up very, very soon. You too. Thanks, Reed. Well, there you have another cracking episode jam packed with some incredible advice from Chris. Remember, head over to 7E, E like elephant, investments.com. You can also uh, Google Chris's name. It's Chris and Sevenly, C S E V E N E Y. Uh, and that is, he, he is all over Google and a very unique name. So definitely check him out. I want to thank you all again for taking some time out of your day to tune in to continue to grow your financial IQ because that's what we're all about here on this show. If you do like this show, the easiest way to give back is to give it a five-star review on iTunes. You can jump over to my website at reedgoosens.com to check out the show notes from today's show. And we're going to do it all again next week. So remember, be bold, be brave, and go give life a crack. Crack.